Bryce, so do you mind being on do you mind being on camera? So Bryce, we're we're here we're we're here oh, let me see. We're here Monday night um with Wall Moms and um at Mutual Aid. And and look here, look who this is. Oh here, we gotta turn this way. <laughs> here. See. This is Bryce. This is my my son's brother's <laughs> Your son's Brother brother-in-law. Brother this is my son's brother-in-law. Oh my gosh, what a small world what we small live in. World, yeah. Huh? And so, Bryce, why are you here tonight? What? Just to get people food. And, and how did you find out about this? Um, I found out about it through a friend, John uh -huh. Stodden. Uh -huh. um, who's doing a lot of work in the community. Um, was following Allies to Abolitionists and found out about the group through that. So. Oh, so you you saw the message to the mayor then? Yeah, saw the message. To and the mayor. what do you think about that? Well, I think it's spot on. Yes. It's yes. kind of a heartbreaking day with like yeah. the news this morning about police being removed from the... Levi, get in the, get in the picture with and Bryce. It was redacted from what I understand. Okay. Oh, okay. Here, get in. But first, get in the picture with Bryce so we can send it to Christopher. <laughs> Uh, okay, there we go. So, All right. Yeah, hi, Christopher, and I know Abby's phone's dead, so she'll probably see this too. So, hi, Abby. <laughs> well, what I do, Bryce, is I upload them to YouTube afterwards. Oh, nice. Yeah. So, you you just have to subscribe to my channel. Uh, just go to Carol Funk and, and you'll see it. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, set this right here. Can you hold this for a second? Then I'll give you some money. Okay. You come out a lot, Bryce? Oh, uh, yeah, I've been doing like. This like every week, like two or three times. Oh wow! That's so awesome. Sunday mornings, um, Sunday mornings, we're down on the with Occupy Denver, Denver and uh, Janet's Kitchen. Okay. We're um, down on the 16th Street Mall. I'm gonna take a picture with you. Too. Oh, I would okay. love that. <laughs> um, um, on the 16th Street Mall on 16th Curtis at 9:30 a.m. every Sunday morning. We feed about a hundred people. Oh wow! Yeah, cool. so hundred. Okay. I would say about a hundred, wouldn't you? Yeah. Sometimes more, sometimes less. Right. But um, and we do the same thing. We don't make the we don't make the insulation like they do here, and uh, and the heaters over here. Did you see that over there? The what? The heaters over there. Did you see that? Oh no, that's 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 a lot. Uh, I would have never thought. Yeah, this is great. I'm so glad. Yeah, there's there's a good number of programs. All right, it's a lot warmer this week too. Right, I was having a time last week. So Sunday morning when we were out there, it was negative nine degrees. <laughs> I know. Huh? Here, I don't know what I'm doing. Hi. Hi. Oh, you're here already. Oh, this is Chanel. This is, Chanel. This is Bryce. Bryce. This and this is Danny and Chelsea. Danny and Chelsea. And, and Bryce is Levi's brother in law. Oh, okay. What yeah, a small world, huh? Here. We didn't know. We, we, just, we just figured that out. I mean, we're like, oh my gosh. Why well, can't. Okay, I'm not doing this right Let me see. There we go. I know. This is a little parking meter, sweetheart. Yes. Nice. <laughs> yes. Also the recipes. So I brought those Beyond Burgers today. Oh, did you? Yeah, they're over there. I brought some lentils and then I used all those apples to make a lot of juice. I still have all those apples. I still have a whole box of apples. You don't have a juice box, so I made like a bunch of juice for my kids and I brought some beers. It's really good. Yeah, that's what I made. Yeah, that's what I can bring some food next week too. Yes. And remember, I just took a picture of everything that's going on. Are they going? They're going. Okay. Oh, Maybe I better grab one. Have you ever had it? Beyond no, I haven't. I have. It, it's really good, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. We still have all the food, though. That's good, good. And you, got, and you guys had, you, what was in here? It was the same thing? Yeah, meat pasta. Uh-huh. Meat pasta. Good. What you got in here? What's in here? I missed this. Let's look and see. Oh, it's oh, lentils. 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 oh, she just brought this, right? Lentils. You just brought this. Yeah. This is lentils. Yes? No, that's the gold one. Hi, Beria. Hi, Beria. How are you, How are you tonight? Good. Um, and then, of course, I, hi, guys. How are you doing? <laughs> hi. And, of course, over here we got. 
we've got the candles and the uh, little heaters and lights that they're doing here. Okay. And then okay, and then I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna filter a little bit. to ask y'all to take some of that power back. Um, I've come up with a few different ways that that's possible. Um, you could put a bill that would take the sheriff away from them. Most, no other place in Denver or in Colorado does the, the mayor would appoint the sheriff. You could put a bill forward to do that. You could take some of that power back. Um, you could stand up to them um, and do things that was to potentially stop these sweeps. Um, it's getting... I don't know, this last week was really, really difficult to watch the last couple of weeks with the cold weather um, and seeing what's been happening to folks and watching their, their only belongings that keep them warm, getting them just destroyed by our police department. And as Terry spoke, uh, you know, the mayor came out and said that we're no longer going to have police officers with the sleeps. Oh wait, no, that's not true. We are going to have police officers with the sleeps. We're not going to be there first. Why? Are they not going to be there anymore because they got the film destroying a tent that a man was sleeping in? I don't know. Um, they've been doing a lot worse stuff than that as well. So, uh, I also sat in on a District 9 uh, uh, crime or safety meeting this last uh, week, and, and I I started to think about, uh, you know, I sit on one side, somebody else is on the other side saying, you know, speak the homeless, do this, do that, and I say, don't, don't ask me to go down, but stay there with the pandemic. And I realized that we're actually not even arguing about what the problem is. The problem is, the city continues to do this. If the city housed all of the folks that didn't have houses, I bet we would have a lot less 
uh, crime, we have less issues with people sleeping on the streets. And if we just started to care about the people that are most vulnerable in our own district, or in our own city, our own country, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm just here to say that there are other options. Um, the mayor is out of control, and you guys have the power to take him down, to at least put him to size. Um, he, he kind of, it, it seems to me that he kind of pushes some of y'all around. And I think that it's time to push back. I hope you don't decide to do that. Especially when you either get him turned out anyway. He might as well stand up, so he sucks. Thanks. Our next speaker is Brian Wilson. Uh, thank you for hearing me, Councilor. Um, I agree with a number of the prior comments that we've heard from um, some of the speakers, uh, particularly uh, David, who just went, uh, Terry, who just went. Uh, so, uh, to that end, RNO reform. Uh, in short, uh, the thought or the idea um, is to give a little bit of um, I'm going to say a voice um, to those who are uh, in those positions where they feel like they are just being swept around the city. Um, so the idea um, is to kind of model this um, off of Empower LA. So what myself and as well as a number of people throughout the city of Denver have already done is register um, neighborhood coalitions, district neighborhood coalitions. These are not affiliated with the city of Denver. They are registered neighborhood organizations, at least as far as the um, charter is concerned or the municipal code. Um, but the idea is to fund from the top down. So hopefully in the future, we'll be able to get some funding um, from municipal funds, whatever. But for right now, it'll just be donations. Um, and uh, hopefully some grant writing, maybe we'll get something, who knows. Um, and then the idea is to take those funds, we'll have a council of representatives made up of people from ideally existing RNOs, if they're interested, um, to decide how to equitably distribute those funds to the district, the various district neighborhood coalitions. And then once there, those district neighborhood coalitions can then uh, disperse the funds equitably again to the RNOs that are already um, in those boundaries. Um, and the goal with those funds would be things like um, neighborhood outreach. Um, it will be for things like maybe paper PO boxes for um, homeless members in their community. Um, and so the whole point, the idea, is that then instead of just the two people who are currently running uh, the registered neighborhood organizations, um, and then in the higher up positions that they will have influence for certain city council members, um, if that's in that thing right now, um, to spread that amongst all Denver rights, whether you own a home or not. Is it Who's here? Alejandro, Robert, hi Robert. Robert, what is this link for? Is this for? Is this for, is this for, is this for what rights are they? Justice. And uh, first, I'd like to say a statement. Who's speaking? Oh, honey, I'm, I still. 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 I Oh, this is city council. Oh, you're going to turn on. We're going to turn on. That was 2015, so six years ago. I need to get on Facebook so I can get on Facebook. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because you're talking about the work. We're going to turn it on. Are you? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, last night, uh, just this uh, at 5.30? 5.30, I think so, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I think he was going to go on live at 4.00. Okay. Yeah. And we heard from the first meeting of the council, from the daily workers, and it's like a wage 
Having a b beyond burger. <laughs> I said I'll drop lentils. I think this is so really important. We see so many small restaurants um, and the people that have worked there actually are struggling. Um, to me, it seems like it's possibly not enough money um, that people are in the hospital.
Officers will attempt to de-escalate the force and or the situation so that lesser force and possibly no force is required. No effort to de-escalate appears from the records available to us, nor were the officers ever asked about the purpose of de-escalate. We know that the department has changed its policy since Mr. McClellan's death with regard to suspicious person call to require that officers stop and observe before initiating an encounter to be certain that there is in fact, a lawful public safety basis for stopping the individual. That new policy will be discussed later in this presentation. After the officers began moving Mr. McClain from the sidewalk, Officer Rodema told the officers, quote, he grabbed your gun, end quote. Officer Rodema told the major crimes investigators that he saw Mr. McClain reach for, the off reach for Officer Rosenblatt's gun. The officers then struggled to restrain Mr. McClain. Officer Rosenblatt attempted a carotid hold. When he released the hold, Brian, he, he could not accomplish it because he was in a bad position. And so, Officer Woodyard wrestled Mr. McClain to the ground. It is important to note this happened within a matter of seconds. Case law has held that a suspect grabbing or attempting to grab an officer's gun authorizes officers to use force up to and including lethal force because a suspect who is able to gain control of an officer's weapon poses a grave risk to officers and others. The body worn camera video at this point is scant because Officer Woodyard and Officer Rosenblatt's cameras have been knocked to the ground. The audio and the subsequent interviews indicate that any threat or perceived threat was dissipated quickly when Mr. McClain was taken to the ground by Officer Woodyard. Once Mr. McClain was wrestled to the ground, he was lying on his side. Officer Woodyard was lying next to him. As Officer Woodyard described, chest to back. Officer Woodyard's gun was underneath him. While lying in this position, Officer Woodyard made a second attempt at a carotid hold. There's conflicting information on the audio of the body worn camera video and in the interviews about whether Mr. McClain was rendered unconscious. One of the officers stated that Mr. McClain made snoring sounds. The panel notes that significantly at the time of this incident, a carotid hold was considered less lethal force under Aurora Police Department policy. Section 5.8.3 permitted officers to apply a carotid hold when, quote, met with violent resistance and when lesser means have been tried unsuccessfully or other means are not feasible, end quote. Carotid holds have since been banned by the city of Aurora as a matter of policy. During an interview with Major Crimes, Officer Woodyard justified the use of the second carotid in reference to the prior attempt or perceived attempt by Mr. McClain to reach for an officer's gun. By his own statements, however, that threat had been dissipated. They were both on the ground and Officer Woodyard was lying on top of his gun. The determination of whether force is reasonable turns on whether the officers were endangered at the precise moment that the force was used. Police officers must calibrate the use of force to the actual resistance they are experiencing. As the level of resistance increases or decreases, the level of force authorizes increases and decreases accordingly. It is unclear from the record what current threat Officer Woodyard was intending to address when he applied the second carotid hold. Finally, I would like to talk about the use of pain and violence techniques. From the moment that the Aurora police officers first encountered Mr. McClain, up until the time... I heard it online and I was like, okay, well, that's right. Excuse me. Up until the time Mr. McClain was placed in the ambulance stretcher, officers applied some form of physical force against him. Even once it should have been obvious that Mr. McClain was not able to resist or escape, given both that he was handcuffed and the presence of multiple officers, the officers continued to use pain-compliant techniques. Throughout, there were times when officers could be seen on body-worn camera footage adjusting and intensifying arm bars and wrist locks, pressing down on Mr. McClain's back or large muscle groups, causing him to cry out in pain while they were on top of him. These appeared to be in response to almost any movement on Mr. McClain's part. The officers justified the continued use of force on the grounds that Mr. McClain continued to resist the officers' commands and showed extraordinary strength. The audio captured by body-worn camera video contains two sharply contrasting narratives. This is some of the most difficult audio to listen to. 
If you choose to listen, I urge you to pay close attention to what Mr. McClain is saying and what the officers are saying and doing. On the one hand, Mr. McClain is pleading and apologizing and expressing pain. He complained several times that he could not breathe, and at one point, an officer was instructed to get off his chest. Mr. McClain can be heard saying, I have no gun. I don't do that stuff. I don't do any fight. I do not. I don't do any fighting. Why are you attacking me? I don't believe in guns. I don't even kill flies. I don't eat meat. I'm not a vegetarian. I don't judge people for anything. I respect all life. Forgive me. All I was trying to do was to become better. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do better to help all life. I will do anything I have to. Sacrifice my identity. I'll do it. I'll do it. You are all phenomenal. You are all beautiful. Forgive me. On the other hand, the officers continued to perceive resistance. Telling Mr. McClain to stop moving and discussing various uses of force to restrain Mr. McClain. It is unclear whether Mr. McClain's movement, interpreted by the officers as resisting, or attempts to escape, or simply efforts, voluntary or involuntary, to avoid the painful force being applied on him, or to improve his breathing, or to accommodate his need to vomit. The officers' use of force did not appear to relent even after Mr. McClain was in handcuffs, became progressively more ill and less responsive, and surrounded by a large group of officers. None of the officers who continued to apply force after Mr. McClain was restrained, was asked to explain their continued use of force. The case law makes clear that force is authorized to meet the resistance at the time that it was applied. The evidence available does not provide a justification for those for the near constant use of very painful force techniques. I will now turn it over to Dr. Castell. Thank you, Dr. So when we look at the point from which EMS arrives uh, in this case, um, there's really two separate things going on. Jonathan has covered uh, the police aspects of this very well. I will dig more into the uh, EMS aspects of this. And as we looked at those, there were several um, categories of findings in which we identified issues in areas where we feel that Aurora Fire Rescue or both Aurora Police Department and Aurora Fire Rescue together can effectuate improvements in the interactions with future patients in this system. Uh, one of the things that we identified that's been brought up in other places as well is that there was a delay in the transfer of control of this patient from the police to the EMS system. Uh, another is the lack of clear communication and the possible loss of information between the police officers and, and Aurora Fire Rescue as they took over care. Uh, the delayed and incomplete assessment of Mr. McLean, which we'll discuss. Uh, the failure to obtain appropriate equipment and have that at Mr. McLean's side. An inaccurate estimation of Mr. McLean's weight. And then ultimately, uh, I'll discuss a little bit about some of the cognitive errors that I saw evidence of here and how those uh, play a role in medical decision making. You can go ahead. Yeah. So in, in discussing the issue of transfer of patient control, there's always in these cases a transition between when a patient who is either a subject or a suspect, um, in Mr. McLean's case, uh, he, he was a subject of a police investigation, um, ultimately has to become a patient. And the point at which that occurs is not always black and white as far as the timing. Uh, however, in, in this case, there was some evidence that 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 there was a delay in that transition uh, the transfer of control really the transfer of authority over what's happening at that scene has to occur for for a person to be to change from a subject of the police investigation to a patient that is under the control and authority of ems and who then falls under the authority of the medical director and the paramedics and emts working under that person's license in this case EMS arrived uh, about six or seven minutes before they actually uh, initiated some hands-on contact with Mr. McLean. Uh, there's uh, several images on the body camera footage of them standing back and observing. And while there is a lot of information that can be gleaned from observation, it is a concern of mine and of the panel that they did not press forward and con initiate some contact with him in, in the form of transitioning him to becoming more of a patient. 
there was certainly some deference to the officers um, even as even after the sedation had occurred there was some um, discussion back and forth and it, it's difficult to say whether that was deference to the police officers on the scene or whether that was efforts at collaboration um, it's always important for these departments to work together um, and it is it is invaluable when they can work together seamlessly however in, in this case the transition was not seamless and it didn't occur in a way where I feel like EMS clearly had the opportunity to step in and do some evaluation that I think was necessary um, in, in some of our discussions we um, came across this culture um, Chief Gray's, Chief, Chief Gray was able to summarize it best, but we came across this culture of the, the concept that the patient isn't a patient until the police say they are. And, and that's something that came through both in our interview with the chief, but also in the interviews with the paramedics who were on scene and in some discussions about the culture of that department. You can go ahead. So this is one of the photographs um, that I captured off of the, the body-worn camera footage. And what you're seeing is the, the Mr. McLean is on the ground below this. Um, and then these are our four, the four uh, members of the fire crew who are standing back and observing, um, watching. And like I said, they have been, they would have been at this point in this position for several minutes. And this is about the time that the uh, EMS crew from Falk arrives. Falk is, uh, Falk Ambulance is the transport crew. Um, uh, Aurora Fire and Rescue does not transport patients. They do initial treatment and assessment. And for the patients that need to be transported, they're transported by Falk. So this was while they were waiting for Falk EMS to arrive, both to affect to a transport of Mr. McLean and to uh, arrive with the medications that they were going to require to sedate him. Um, they had already made a decision to sedate at this point, and you can forward it. They had already made a decision to sedate at this point, and there was discussion ongoing about the timing and how long things were taking, which I'll get into a little bit more later. This is an additional photograph of um, now the arrival of the Falk paramedics. So at this point, there's there's five medical personnel standing around this um, this young man with uh, the, the law enforcement officers having him in custody, and no one has initiated hands-on contact at this point yet. And, and so this is the, the point at which um, there should have been some initiation of contact and the transition of authority really needed to have occurred prior to this point. So you can go forward. So in response to this, we felt like the recommendations that came through clearly were a need to clarify the policies and do more teaching and education on the transfer of authority from one agency to the other. Um, Interagency relations are very important, but ultimately um, all of those things have to be superseded by the the importance of keeping patients safe. Um, the culture within the departments needs to be one of patient advocacy and patient safety as the primary driver of, of all things that happen within these departments. And we really want to see um, uh, Aurora Fire Rescue build a culture of patient advocacy. Uh, there is um, a duty to act um, policy and language within Aurora Fire Rescue, and that is uh, an a, a policy that allow that allows them and compels them to step in if they're seeing things um, that are endangering patient safety and on a scene and with the initiation and with the passage of the um, duty to intervene uh, legislation in Colorado that, that refers to the public safety officers, I felt it was important for them to review their duty to act policy within a RFI rescue and make sure that that language uh, was in line with the stronger um, directives in the duty to intervene policy that governs law enforcement. So you can go forward. So there were several communication failures uh, in this um, handoff, uh, when the handoff ultimately did occur. And one of the important pieces of research that is out there is about the difficulty in keeping all of the information that's relevant to a case cohesive and communicating all of that information in a way that both the sender and the receiver of that information hear and, and retain the same things. Um, every transition of patient care uh, does involve a potential for loss of information and there was some of that at play here. Um, I'm going to play a video on the next slide of really what constitutes the entirety of the report that was from the police to the EMS agency and the information that they were working with at the scene. You've got Jonathan. Ooh, we should have audio.
So this is the approach of the paramedic or of the basic EMT from that crew. There is about a 10 second interaction, which we're not hearing the audio on. So I apologize for that. But essentially they said that he'd had a carotid hold, that they had, um, he had some vomiting and that he was, the quote was, he was quote, definitely on something unquote. And that was it. That was the entirety of the discussion um, between now the person who is the lead police officer on that scene and and communicated, unfortunately, to the junior most EMT on that crew. Uh, whether any of that information ultimately made it to the paramedic were not, is not clear. Uh, but what is clear through the interviews is that the both paramedics did not recall having been told that one, that there was a successful carotid hold with loss of consciousness or that Mr. McLean had been unconscious at any point during this interaction. And so what we recommended, and you can go ahead to the next slide, what we recommended to address these things are to really research and develop within the um, departments together uh, a handoff tool, whether that is a mental tool, whether it's a written tool, whether it's an electronic tool, um, some device or method by which um, all of the agencies who handle patient information from Aurora Police to Aurora Fire, potentially to um, to Falk and then from Falk to the emergency departments, um, that all of those transitions of care are done in a uniform way so that all of that information is conveyed clearly and in the expected format and in the expected order. That way the people know if there's anything that's been missed. Um, and then the other thing that came through in that video is the fact that um, there was a discussion that was happening on the side. There was this interruption of a patient care report that was offered and then immediately uh, a another interruption in that discussion along with everybody moving around. Um, that level of distraction and that level of multitasking um, is one of the things that's been identified as a major issue in information loss when it comes to transitioning patients. And so the recommendation is that there to be developed a formal process in addition to the tool that there is even just 15 or 30 seconds where the the the, the receiver and the reporter on patient care information are, are giving each other undivided attention so information is communicated clearly um, you can advance so when it comes to the delayed the delayed assessment and the incomplete assessment of mr. McLean by way of background, uh, assessment is, is generally broken into both a primary assessment and a secondary assessment. The primary assessment is essentially a walk-up quick impression of what's going on, um, an assessment of a brief level of consciousness, is a patient responding or not, um, an assessment of, of essentially the basic ABCs, just like we all learned in CPR class, um, and is, you know, is their airway intact, are they breathing, do they have a pulse, and then identifying major life threats in this case if they had life-threatening bleeding or if they had things that were that needed to be intervened on immediately and then generally it includes an assessment of vital signs and the primary assessment is the one that lays the foundation for the, the clinical decision making um, secondary assessment sometimes happens later sometimes doesn't happen at all depending on the circumstances sometimes is very limited just to a specific complaint um, if you have a broken leg it's a very easy assessment if you have a complex medical condition it can be very complicated uh, However, what we really know is, and what we acknowledge in this report is that limits of the ability for paramedics to do this and for EMTs to do this on scene is a, is a everyday reality of working in the EMS environment. And really, we understand, and I, I know I understand in my experience, there are lots of patients who can't get a complete assessment. And, and that is a daily reality, both in, in EMS and in emergency medicine. Some patients are unconscious and some patients are, are not cooperative and some patients are, are don't have the information that we need and so the, the limitations in our ability to assess are definitely a reality in this environment when you're transitioning a patient from law enforcement control to medical control um, it can be especially challenging because there is a need for support from both sides to to do a medical assessment without compromising law enforcement's ability to maintain control and prevent injury, both of the patient and of all of the surrounding personnel. And so there is a reality that there are limitations. However, it was the feeling of the panel in this case that there was there was not enough limitation in their ability to access and assess Mr. McLean to justify the lack of assessment that was done. And so we offered several recommendations about that. And, and in addition, talked a little bit about um, 
that some of that deference and how that played into um, the delay in their assessment, and then the time pressures that uh, they were feeling, whether it was because of the diagnosis itself. Um, once they had settled on a diagnosis of excited delirium, that that diagnosis with carries some time pressure inherent in it. Uh, in addition, there's probably some self-imposed uh, time pressures and then also some pressures from the surrounding officers and, and firefighters asking what was taking so long and, and you know, where was the ambulance and, and, you know, put your head in and check and see what's going on. So all of those things led to the conclusions and the recommendations that we offer on the next slide. Essentially, it sounds very basic, but there's a lot here. Um, it's the look at policies, procedures, and terrain, training surrounding patient assessment. Um, with the differentiation specifically between basic assessment and between a, an assessment that should be um, a minimum standard for assessment of patients who are being sedated. In this case, there's certainly a reason that the assessment was limited initially. However, it was the feeling of the panel that we felt once a decision was made to effectuate sedation, chemical sedation, that that should have carried with it a, a much higher threshold for trying to get in and do further assessment before sedation was administered. Um, the, the onus is on the paramedic to, to do that assessment and to almost push in and, and be able to get that done for the safety of the patients. And the, the flip side of that, or the same side of that, is that because there is such an imperative that this assessment be done, at least in portions, prior to sedation, um, particularly because the sedation itself will interfere with the paramedic's ability to continue to get some of the assessment that helps them make a diagnosis, that, that training it to law enforcement should emphasize the fact that it is important for them to have adequate time and access to patients to assess them, particularly when those subjects that are with law enforcement are going to become patients of EMS. You can go for it. So the equipment issue that we brought up was the failure to obtain the appropriate equipment. Uh, there were several places in the body-worn camera footage where I was looking for the appearance of equipment, the appearance of a monitor, the appearance of oxygen. And uh, that's I did not see that um, throughout this encounter. Um, there were some equipment pieces that arrived sporadically throughout, but not what I would traditionally have expected the crews that I supervise or other crews to bring to the side of a patient who is in this um, scenario. Uh, there is policy that clarifies um, what transport EMS crews are to bring when they respond secondarily to Aurora Fire Rescue, but um, we were not able to put hands on policy that identified what the Aurora Fire Rescue crews are to bring to the side of a patient when they are first on scene. Um, but my contention and the contention of the panel is that, that the presence of equipment could potentially have prompted further assessment. It's hard to stand over a bunch of equipment and not feel com some compunction to, to begin to use some of that. Um, additionally, there was not a pre-sedation checkoff to verify that all of their equipment that they require for sedation under their protocol was present at, at Mr. McLean's side. And ultimately, what we found from the reports and information in the interviews is that one of those pieces of equipment, the capnography monitor, was actually not where it was supposed to be. It was ultimately in the, in the ambulance, but it was not in the location that anybody expected, and there was a delay in application of that device, which could have provided some useful information over the course of this care. Um, ultimately, the cardiac monitors and other um, tools to assess vital signs were not applied until Mr. McLean was in the ambulance several minutes after his sedation, and unfortunately, at the point at which these were applied, he was already in cardiac arrest. And so we lost the opportunity, potentially, to intervene if there had been um, something indicated on the cardiac monitor that he was clinically declining. And so you can advance. And this resulted in several recommendations. Um, the first being another, obviously, review of policy protocols and trainings to make sure that there's a complete pre-sedation assessment um, as far as can be done um, whenever feasible, um, including pre-sedation assessments of cardiac and capnography monitoring, with obviously the caveat that there are limitations to this, and we understand those um, exist in, in all of these environments. Uh, that said, uh, the protocol gives a list of things that need to be completed in a post-sedation environment, particularly in excited delirium patients and we felt that that list should be prioritized with particular attention to completion of all of the aspects of a primary survey that are not able to be completed in patients that require sedation early on in the process. 
um, particularly monitor application because that provides so much valuable and useful information in patients that are clinically declining. Uh, the recommendation that surrounds that really is a strong recommendation for implementation of a manual checklist process. Uh, sedation, uh, chemical sedation of patients uh, in this scenario and with the diagnosis of excited delirium is is one of the events we refer to as uh, as a high risk, low frequency event in medicine. Um, it's a terminology that's come out of several industries, um, but all of those industries that deal with high risk, low frequency events um, have implemented to varying degrees checklist processes. Um, anyone who has gone back and watched uh, the the Sullenberg um, interviews and or read uh, his book about the landing of the of the airliner on the Hudson can understand the importance of checklists and how they contribute to safety, uh, even in scenarios where you're moving very quickly, and especially in scenarios where you're moving very quickly. You can go on to the next slide. So the inaccurate estimation of the weight. Um, Mr. McLean's weight was uh, was overestimated um, by a large degree, um, depending on who was asked what his weight was. Uh, the weight estimates varied from a low of about 160 pounds to a high of 100 kilograms, which is 220 pounds, um, by all the various sources. Uh, at the time of his death, he was 140 pounds. Um, the only consistent thing we found from all of the places that his weight was reported is, is that it was consistently overestimated. Um, what we looked at was the fact that, number one, I think a better assessment would have potentially helped in improving the estimate. I'm, I'm, trying to, like, I'm trying to speak over the, the conversation going on in the background. Would um, everybody mute their um, um, microphones? Thank you. Sorry about that. Speaking of distractions, um, so I think a better assessment would have have improved their their weight estimate. Um, one of the primary pieces of a primary survey when we talk about airway, breathing, circulation is that is the ABCDE. The D is the assessment of, of disability or their mental status, and the E is exposed. It's get a look at the patient, either remove clothing or get a better sense of what's going on with the patient by exposing their skin or any of those things. And that was a step that was not done here prior to that sedation um, and may have contributed to a better estimate on his weight. Um, we then got into this um, cognitive shortcut of rounding and um, shortcutting the actual math that occurs in, in the dosing of ketamine. Um, the, the small, medium, and large dosing, which you hear referred to and we discussed in, in the report, really leaves us in a place where we had an error in estimation, which was then compounded by a rounding issue um, that may be a perfectly valid tool, but doesn't comply with the way the protocol is written. Um, and so those two things together combined to result in a dose of ketamine that was, was much higher than it, the an actual weight and an actual mathematical calculation would have resulted in. That said, there is no definitive evidence that we found uh, in this that ketamine had a role in Mr. McLean's death. Um, his clinical status was declining prior to the administration of sedation. Um, if anything, the ketamine may have, contr have contributed to some difficulties on the part of the paramedics after his sedation in assessing the fact that he was continuing to decline. But that decline that he was having was, going, was, was occurring before the ketamine was administered. Um, secondly, the, and more importantly, I think, is that there's not evidence from the coroner or any of the records that accurate dosing would have changed his outcome. Um, unfortunately, um, it is not a situation in which we can, fortunately or unfortunately, it's not a situation in which we can take this specific extra 140-ish milligrams of ketamine and, and place the blame there. It's just that's not how this case went had transpired. Um, the important takeaway, though, is the implication that this has for future patients and for many, many of the medications that are used in the EMS environment that are all based on weight because there is not the opportunity to weigh these patients um, in the field, particularly when they can't tell you how much they weigh. And there's a lot of medications that are weight based. And so looking at this, go ahead, you can move forward. We made a couple of recommendations based on the issues here. Uh, one was to explore education and training on accurate weight estimation. Um, the 
piece of this that, that came through in some of the reports is that there's good evidence that the weight of, of young black men is consistently overestimated in medicine and in healthcare. And even just having that piece of information in the back of their mind will allow paramedics and EMTs to make a mental adjustment of an estimate that they're making uh, to prevent that inherent overestimation that, that can occur in this population of patients and adjust for that. And being educated on that is enough to help to offset that one place where this um, role of implicit bias um, rears its head in, in, in the medical environment. Um, the other option is to give them other tools to, to verify an accurate weight. Um, driver's licenses and state IDs, all have wait listed, the patients that can communicate can be asked. And then we wanted to ensure that there was consistency in the protocols across the whole department. We wanna make sure that if they start teaching it one way, that it stays that way throughout. Um, and if there are cognitive shortcuts, they need to be put in and implemented, impl implemented in um, protocol so that they are permissible under the rules. You can give me the next slide. Lastly, um, there were some cognitive errors that played a role here, and without getting into the gory details of cognitive decision making in medicine, um, essentially, once someone has decided that a, a diagnosis is happening, um, there is a lot of um, mental energy that goes into looking for information that helps prove that diagnosis, and is and it is very, very difficult, even in very experienced clinicians, to separate themselves from that diagnosis and look at either information that doesn't fit or information that contradicts what they have already found. And the particular one that I was going to bring up, and I bring up in the in the uh, report as well, is this concept of ascertainment bias. Um, ascertainment bias is when you go into a situation expecting something, and then you look for information that continues to prove your expectations. And the example that I give is the idea of a patient who's collapsed. Um, if you were to close your eyes and picture for a minute that you're an EMT, and I want you to, I'm going to send you out on a collapsed patient, and I tell you that piece of information I give you next is that patient collapsed in a football stadium. Or alternatively, I tell you, okay, that patient collapsed in an elementary school. Or that that patient collapsed in a nursing home. And if you're picturing in your head what that patient looks like each time I change the setting or the scenario, if they collapsed in a bar, if I sent you because they collapsed at the jail. If your patient in your head does not look exactly the same in every one of those scenarios, then this is a little bit of those, that cognitive decision making that I'm talking about here. And this, this can allow an introduction of bias into clinical decision making. And it's important for medics to understand how that plays a role and the role that protocols have and the adherence to protocols have in diminishing the bias that can affect um, these decisions. You can go ahead. So our recommendations here uh, are basically just to educate on cognitive errors in clinical decision making, understanding the process of how this happens, uh, that we want to continue to provide education on excited delirium. We, I, in the description, we get further into the idea of how these errors can lead to somebody giving a diagnosis like excited delirium and then only searching for information that validates that diagnosis and missing signs that there is potentially something else going on. Um, the focused excited delirium education is important because it is um, such a unique entity within altered mental status or within behavioral problems or, or those issues that rolling it into other protocols or rolling it into other disease entities is is potentially fraught with danger because you then roll that set of treatments into disease entities in which it's not appropriate. So uh, the recommendation was to maintain a standalone um, excited delirium protocol. Um, it, is a it is a subsection of a protocol that's appropriate, but it is a separate disease entity that, that if it's maintained that way will allow us to manage that specific uh, illness as a unique entity and not confound it with other issues that may cause altered mental status or psychiatric or behavioral problems. Um, there are some things ongoing. Um, there's, there's a ton of discussion around ketamine and EMS right now, and I think that over the next um, probably six to 12 months, there'll be some things coming um, from the state, there'll be some things coming from the federal government, and that uh, Aurora will be well served to, to incorporate all of that into their findings um, and into changes in their protocol. Next slide.
We did make some specific protocol recommendations. These are probably more interesting for um, the fire and EMS people who get down in the weeds on protocol. Um, but there were some recommendations about cross-linking, um, improving the, the connections between protocols for, for situations when you move from one to another. Um, the uh, discussion of checklists for high frequency, high, high risk, low frequency events and for specific complex tasks. And then there were recommendations around specific additions to the excited delirium protocol in um, Aurora that have been shown through the research to provide benefit to patients. Um, some of them are already in protocol and we just refined them and some of them are, would be new additions. In God. And then there were a couple places I wanted to just say some positive things about the department um, as far as what I was able to witness and what we were able to see on the, on the video and in our review. Um, the sedation and the interaction itself was a low frequency event. When Mr. McLean unfortunately had a cardiac arrest event and his heart stopped, it's clear from the video footage that dealing with a cardiac arrest scenario with a situation where a patient's heart is stopped and we have to take over CPR and all of those, um, all of that resuscitation process, it's clear that this is a situation that the, the, the paramedics are very well trained for. The, the snippets of video and the, and the resuscitation descriptions um, are a classic demonstration of pit crew CPR, which is definitely a best practice and has been shown to improve neurologic outcomes in cardiac arrest resuscitation. Uh, that came through loud and clear that their training and education and experience with this is solid and is a best practice that's already ongoing. Uh, the second piece um, that we wanted to point out was their quality assurance and quality improvement process. Um, it is the structure is based on just culture. It's a multidisciplinary, multi-agency quality review. Uh, it is uh, something that occurs on a regular basis and is involved with the, with their EMS physicians at a high level. And um, it is important to have that structure in place in order to ensure that there's a full, thorough look at patients where in situations where there's a bad outcome um, and to identify ways that the system can improve. Um, these reviews are uh, peer review protected. They do have um, certain legal protections that allow a, a, the system to be able to improve without um, without outside eyes uh, in order to be able to um, have full disclosure of events that go through that go through this process. And so, as it pertains to Mr. McLean's case in particular, this was not something that I was able to review as part of the panel or that the panel was able to review was the results of the quality assurance process. And that is certainly a set of, of protection, legal protections that I'm highly respectful of as a practicing physician because um, we want to have events that we can look at and make sure that patients are safer. Um, without that um, level of scrutiny and exposure. So let me see, I think that's my last slide. Yeah, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, uh, the uh, Roberto Villa Senior. Good evening. What I'll be talking about is the, the post-incident investigation of the case by the Royal Police Department. The major crime unit was assigned to the case and on the video you can see Sergeant Leonard advising officers that this was going to be a major crime unit case because Mr. McLean had cord out referring to the stoppage of his heart while he's in the ambulance. At that time, he advised, excuse me, advised the involved officers to separate and not talk to each other, which is standard procedure when these type of events occur in order to try and preserve the integrity of the interviews. Upon arrival at the scene, the major crime unit was briefed on the incident by Sergeant Nunes who was also another supervisor who was on the scene. The Aurora's major crime unit, along with Denver PD's major crime unit, both responded in fulfillment of a memorandum of understanding between two agencies. This is an area where Aurora PD is progressive in joining with surrounding agencies to review these type of incidents. Unfortunately, however, the assignment of an investigator from within the agency of the involved participants tends to water down that, that effort to make sure that the investigation is not biased. Detective Ingui from Aurora is assigned as the lead investigator. Next slide, please. Major Crimes Unit initiates the investigation that involves the interview of the officers. They interview the police officers either the night of the event or a couple of days after. Specifically, Officer Woodyard and Officer Rosenblatt were interviewed on August 25th, 
and Officer Rodemel was interviewed in August 28th. The officers were not allowed to view their body-worn camera prior to being interviewed. No other police officers were interviewed at that time, even though there are several other officers on scene while Mr. McClain has been held down on the ground and could have given their perspective as to the level of resistance and what they observed. This was one of our first indicators of the concern that we developed as a panel of how the case was investigated and the absence of internal affairs as a component of the post investigation. The firefighters were not interviewed until sometime, interviewed until sometime after the event. Specifically, Firefighter Bradley was interviewed on September 9th. Lieutenant Kachuniak and Paramedic Cooper were both interviewed on September 11th. These interviews were two weeks after the event. And then Firefighter De Jesus was not interviewed until September 23rd, which is four weeks after the event. We felt this could be problematic because at this time, the event had already become controversial and there was a lot of publicity about the event. Having that much time passed since the event occurred takes away the spontaneity of the responses that you could get from the participants. And really best practice would be that you would try and get those interviews done as quickly as possible. They had at least four detectives and one investigator respond to the scene that night. And if needed, between the two agencies, they could have brought more personnel out to conduct those interviews in a quicker time period. We also, in the review of this investigation, developed some concerns about the questioning and the leading nature of the questioning by the Major Crimes Unit. The officers involved were not asked key questions, as we pointed out several times, about their conduct, the justification for their actions, their thought process of why they did what they did. Also, at times, the questions appeared to be trying to generate what is looked at in the report as magic language, which comes from case law, exonerating the use of force. Next slide, please. As an example of this, I took some excerpts of the interview of Officer Woodward by Detective Ingrid. And I'll read them here. These are the words taken directly off of the recorded interview. Okay, and then you heard Officer Rodema say, he's going for your gun or going for a gun. Officer Woodward says, yes. Detective Ingrid says, okay, and how did that physically make you feel? Woodward replies, to be honest, kind of sick. Okay, besides sick, how would you, were you, what? And Officer Woodward then kind of ums, and Detective Ingrid says, emotionally, how did you feel? Well, I ran my emotions up. Next slide, please. Detective Ingrid continues, okay, were you nervous? Yeah. Were you scared? A little bit, yeah. Okay, so was there fear within you? Yes, there was. Detective Ingrid says, okay, both for your own safety and, and at that point, Officer Woodward finishes saying, for my safety and the officers on scene. The leading nature of these questions and the quality posed, it raises concerns about, you know, trying to get the individuals to that location where they say the words that have been shown by case law that it does justify the use of force actions. Next slide, please. In addition, the report of the Major Crimes Unit, in Pano's opinion, somewhat stretched the record in an apparent attempt to exonerate the actions of the officers rather than present a neutral version of the facts. For example, the report stated that the officers were there, quote, to check on his well-being and that they attempted to explain to McClain why they wanted to talk to him and determine if he needed medical assistance. Nothing that we could find in the record, the video or the interview, supported these assertions. The closest evidence in the record is that Officer Woodward stated that he would have stopped Mr. McClain even absent the call because he was acting strange. None of the officers ever expressed concern that he might need medical help. An emergency medical service appears to have been so in compliance with the Aurora policy that whenever a blotted hold is applied, EMS must be called to the scene to do an evaluation. Furthermore, Detective Ingrid wrote, Officers Rodema, Woodward, and Rosenblatt continued to struggle with the violently resisting McClain through their entire encounter even after he was placed in the handcuffs. While it is true that at least one or two officers were in contact with Mr. McClain until he was placed on the gurney, 
The video in the gallery does not support the claim that Mr. McClain was violent and resistant throughout the contract. Yeah. If you actually get hurt, you can actually hear crying, pleading, vomiting at times, and completely silent at all. Any movement on his part was met with swift countermeasure and control over the body pressure of major motion groups all of which appeared to cause further harm to the Sunday night third. I would love to see the Sunday night third. It's unknown if the game caused further movement. I'm just going to be part of this new cycle that was generated. I remember talking about the movement. What's that? 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 I'm going to get going, guys. So if you want to catch up. Or keep up with this. Um, Eliza, I know we're at. I'll share the link in the description. You guys have a good night. Oh, I have to tell you because that's what I do. Remember, it's our time. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. And it's our duty to win. And we must love and support one another. We have nothing to lose, but we love you guys. Good night.